So this is a remarkable panel. And um, it is, uh, we're going to have a great conversation about the energy system of the future. Um, just a quick reminder, I'm going to introduce people very, very briefly. But if you want to get their full biographical information, you can pick up a summary of their biographies uh, on the front table. I'm going to start here, and then I'm going to have a seat. And I'm going to start by introducing Mandy Mahoney. Mandy is the director of the Building Technologies Office at the US Department of Energy. Welcome, and congratulations on your new position. Really looking forward to having a great conversation. There it goes. Good afternoon. Y'all are my official first um, <laughs> external engagement in my new role. This is my fifth week at the Department of Energy, so I'm just thrilled to be with all of you today. Uh, and thank you to, for having me and for ESI for convening this annual event. It's, there's so much excitement about today. Uh, and having us come after the senators just inspiring remarks is wonderful. Um, and many of the things he said really resonated with me. As you can hear from my accent, I do hail from the Deep South. And so how buildings drive home um, diversity, equity, and inclusion goals of this administration is really centered to my heart and the work that I'm committed to doing as a person, but also in this role at the Building Technologies Office. And so today I look forward to talking to you about the programs that we're doing. Um, I hope Dan will help me watch time because David, great, <laughs> thank you. Yes, we've, being that we have six panelists today. Um, and so when we think about buildings, we really think about how they are at the center of the technology revolution. You know, we spend our time in buildings. And when you look at how natural resources are being consumed, we still are using more energy in buildings um, than anywhere else. It still eclipses transportation. And so it's, it is critical to continue driving forward the work that we have to do to upgrade building stock, to uh, invest in and in design new technology. Uh, but also, again, something that's really central, like that's always in my heart being from the South is that so many of the buildings that we inhabit are just substandard. And so as we are thinking about the leading edge technology that we want to be adopting, we've also got to think about the safety, the habitability of the buildings that so many people are in. So many people that exist. When you hear people talk about energy burden, what it actually is shorthand for is that building is leaky. There's hot air coming in in the summer, and, or hot air, yeah, hot air in the summer and cold air in the winter. And so it's really hard and there's, it, it makes, you, it's an unhealthy building to be in. So what is driving me as we look at the, the leading edge technology that we're doing research and development on um, is not just that we figure out the best not technological solution, but it's a solution that can really work for all people. And so one of those issues that we were working on is actually cold climate heat pumps. And so that is a new pro prize that we have launched at uh, at DOE, it's actually the Residential Cold Climate Heat Pump Challenge, and already several manufacturers are on track to get the new residential models out on the market next year. So we will continue to be working to drive those technologies so that they can work in the colder climate, so that we can count on them, especially as we have more um, crazy weather happening and we see snaps. Um, and like we saw last year, and even in the South, where we, right before Christmas in Tennessee and North Carolina, we had blackouts because we saw an intense snap of cold. And so we at DOE see it's really critical to figure out the cold climate challenge for heat pumps, and we're excited to have this official partnership to do that. I also want to tell you some good news about the bipartisan infrastructure law, an announcement that the secretary made last week. Uh, we have, she announced that we are investing $225 million in building energy codes. And she was in New Orleans with the National Home Builders Association to um, 
to spotlight work that, that we are doing in the South and in Louisiana um, so that the building habitability can improve so we can get higher quality buildings that people are living in. And that project is, that funding is going to 27 projects around the country, states, cities, tribes, and other partners. And we will be, there's a big data component, data collection component of that also, so that we can continue to be improving not just the adoption of new codes, but that folks that are enforcing them actually know how to ensure that buildings are built to these new codes, so that we're getting training done um, on them, so that the full potential is realized. And given my time, I am now going to conclude, but look forward to further conversation with everyone as we move into the discussion. Thank you, Mandy. And thank you for making this your first external engagement. I think technically it was your choice, so <laughs> you could have said no, but we're happy you said yes. Thank you so much for being here. Uh, next up, we have Lisa Jacobson. Uh, followers of ESI might say, wait a minute, wasn't she just on a panel back in March around the Clean Energy Fact, Sustainable Energy in America Fact Book? You bet, and she's back. Lisa is the president of the Business Council for Sustainable Energy. Take it away, Lisa. Thank you so much. And congratulations to you, Dan, and to the entire EESI team. Just an amazing event. I've had the opportunity to be here this morning and listen to all the discussion. And it really is inspiring. And if we think about what we were doing exactly a year ago, many of us we're in the trenches kind of fighting to see if we could get um, some of this landmark legislation enacted. And yes, we did. And so now we're also very busy trying to implement it well. So I appreciate all the attention that your panels have spent on really the building blocks and, and what this panel is about, you know, the future. But you know, before we talk about the future, I think it's important to think about where we are and kind of looking at the last decade or more, a few thoughts to share. So where are we? We certainly have in the United States a more diverse uh, power and energy system. That's very good news. We are cleaner and we are more energy efficient with our energy and electric system. But we face very significant risks, energy security, global competitiveness issues, and clearly the impacts of climate change. So to level set a little bit, I'm going to share just a few kind of top line uh, facts from the 2023 Sustainable Energy in America fact book. And you can watch that full panel discussion that we had with EESI in March, and I invite all participants to do that. But, but at a high level, let me just say that in the United States and around the world, the clean energy transition is well underway. And it's being led by a broad portfolio of energy efficiency and clean energy technologies, products, and services. Just looking at the very short term, in 2022, coming out of the COVID pandemic business climate, we still had record-breaking years in terms of deployment and investment. And they spanned the areas of um, renewable energy production and for a record-breaking year on the proportion of renewable energy that was integrated into our electricity mix. We had record-breaking years for sustainable transportation in the signs of electric vehicle sales. We also had record-breaking years in energy storage. I could go on, but we clearly have much more to do. Um, I also wanted to tick through a couple of other contextual issues. You know, I spoke about the impacts of climate change. We have made very significant emissions reductions but we still have much more to do to meet our own ob obligations as a country under the Paris Agreement, and also just to keep up with sound science. But so where are we? Uh, we are at pre-pandemic levels for our economy-wide greenhouse gas emissions reductions, and that is good. And we made some uh, emissions reductions in the last full year, 2022, but we have ways to go. Um, we're about 14% below 2005 emissions, and that's the base year that we account for our target of 50 to 52 percent um, below 2005 levels under the Paris Agreement. So we've got a lot to do. Interestingly, the power sector has really been leading the way, and we are about 35 percent below our 2005 emissions. And that's been done uh, with a lot of investment, a lot of public-private partnership, um, a lot of long-term policy support, and so, um, you know, I am uh, anxious and ready to move, but I'm also optimistic because we have been able to move the needle very significantly. 
I just came and some of my colleagues have just come from a meeting of utility commissioners from around the country in Austin, Texas. It is really hot there. It's hot here too and hot in Arizona and hot in many, many states. It just makes you realize how much climate change is impacting our country and that's just heat. We could talk about extreme cold and, and other events, but looking at 2022, this was the third costliest climate disaster year on record. 3.4 million Americans had to evacuate their homes due to those storms. Many of those storms were a billion dollars or more. In fact, we had 18 of them. So I, you know, we have to keep that in mind. So we're talking about the future. I was going to highlight in my last few moments uh, digital technologies. That's kind of my, uh, my showpiece for the moment because it is cross-cutting, cross-cutting in terms of all technologies and cross-cutting to benefit all of our economy segments. And it's really on the rise. And our fact book this year, for the first time, covered data, data on digital solutions. So I encourage, you know, I'm happy to talk more about it, but you know, in terms of the future, there are many technologies we're going to use. Uh, but I think digital technology solutions can really um, scale up the benefits in terms of our energy productivity, our competitiveness, and our innovation. Thank you. Thank you, Lisa. Next up is my friend Malcolm Wolf. Malcolm is president and CEO of the National Hydropower Association. It is now. Okay. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Great to be here. Um, thanks, Dan, again for the for the invitation. Um, Many of you, I think all of you now, if I were to talk about a wind farm, you have something, a vision in mind, a solar array, you have a sense of what that looks like. Um, but I'm stunned how many folks have no sense of what a hydropower facility is or does. Uh, the number of emails I get about the Western drought and how come hydropower is using up all the water. Uh, we don't use up the water, it runs through the facility. So, um, so I wanted to quickly share in the time I've got um, a few thoughts about how the hydropower industry has a role in accelerating the clean energy transition. So I want to quickly talk a little bit about who the industry is, why you might want to care, um, what's at risk, uh, and a little bit about what are the, some of the key policy issues that are, are still pending here uh, in Congress. So who we are, we provide about 7% of electricity generation, uh, providing power to about 30 million Americans. So uh, I'm amazed, you know, 30 million Americans is a lot of people, but often we're left out, forgotten, or taken for granted in a lot of the clean energy conversations. So that's equivalent to 80 gigawatts of existing carbon-free hydropower. That's either reservoir hydropower or run of river hydropower. There's another 22, 23 gigawatts of pump storage. Um, so together, that's over 100 gigawatts of carbon-free generation that's already on the grid. So why should you care? Um, let me give you four reasons. Um, first, climate. Um, with over 100 gigawatts of carbon-free generation, that's a lot of generation, um, which is already on the grid, which is amazing and wonderful, and we need to keep those facilities going so we don't go backwards on climate. Um, but equally important, second reason, 24-7 reliability. Um, I love wind, I love uh, solar, I love batteries. Um, but batteries are, are really effective right now in the two-hour range, maybe the four-hour range, you know, the sun goes down almost every night. You know, we need power 24 seven to, you know, watch Netflix and, and charge our phones and everything else. So having energy storage that's flexible, that can go online when, um, when variable wind and solar aren't available or when a traditional hydropower or a traditional fossil fuel plant trips offline. Um, we need that 24 seven reliability and it needs to have long duration energy storage because there are times when you know, the wind doesn't blow for days on end. Um, third reason that you might want to care, essential grid services. Often overlooked, because right now with wind and with coal and, and gas, we've got plenty of it. But as those uh, re, uh, uh, cycle off, um, we're going to need other forms of technologies to provide those essential grid services. What am I talking about? Black start. Uh, when there is a grid failure, how do you start up the grid without electricity? We're 6% of the grid, but we're 40% of the black star. Spinning reserves. Don't really have to think about it until you don't have it anymore. As coal and natural gas retires, we're going to need all of that inertia and other resources that hydropower provides. Final reason is new gigawatts. Uh, Department of Energy a few years ago did a study without building new dams, just using the existing infrastructure, we can get 50 new gigawatts of hydropower. 
97% of dams are not powered. I'll say that again, only 3% of the existing fleet is powered. Most of those facilities are for flood control, irrigation, recreation, water storage. We only actually have 3% of the power. So there's a lot of potential with the existing infrastructure. So the reason I mention this is because I think we could go backwards in our efforts to decarbonize the grid and to have a 24-7 reliable grid. We have about half of the non-federal fleet up for relicensing in the next dozen years. Relicensing typically takes 7.6 years. There are unfortunately dozens and dozens of examples of it taking many decades. Uh, and these facilities are right now questioning whether they should relicense or just surrender. Um, and if they surrender, it could mean going backwards on climate, backwards on a reliable grid, maybe locking in carbon-based uh, resources for a lot longer than, than we otherwise would. Um, so uh, fortunately, uh, a number of folks here in Congress are looking at a number of options. There's a bipartisan bill getting a hearing tomorrow. Um, Senator Daines and Senator Cantwell have a license reform bill. There's a similar bill that um, uh, House uh, Energy and Commerce Chair, Chairwoman Kathy McMorris Rogers is sponsoring. So we've got license reform bills that really have serious traction in both the House and the Senate. We think it's important that that get addressed in whatever Congress does on energy permitting. Um, there's an infrastructure tax bill um, that Senators uh, Cantwell and Murkowski have been pushing uh, to try to incentivize infrastructure investments in environmental safety and dam safety. There's also a 21st century dam bill that's going to get reintroduced. We've worked hard with our environmental friends and tribal friends to have a bipartisan uh, push to address existing repowering existing dams, creating more generation from dams, but also dam removal, where the non-powered dam no longer serves a purpose. So a lot of really interesting intersection between clean energy, environmental policy, water resources, uh, a lot of exciting things happening. Thank you, Malcolm. Uh, it's my pleasure to introduce Ralph Cleveland. Ralph is the president and CEO of the American Association of Blacks and Energy. Welcome, Ralph. Thank you very much. Uh, first, let me say it's a pleasure for me to be here, and I am very appreciative of the opportunity to spend a little bit of time. Um, first, I have to give you this warning. I'm a recovering engineer, uh, and what that tends to mean, I've tried to overcome that um, trait, uh, but what that typically means, and as, as even we talk about the new energy system or the future energy system, there tends to be uh, a focus on the technology and or the infrastructure. But truly what I want to do is expand your definition of the system. So in my definition of the system, the system also includes the people in the workforce. Uh, the system also includes the processes, the policies, the practices associated with how those people behave and operate in the system. The system also includes the supply chain. I've actually run, uh, had the pleasure of running two Fortune 500 company supply chains. So I know how important that is. Nothing happens without a really good and reliable, resilient supply chain. It also th then includes the customers and the end users. Uh, and as the president and CEO for the American Association of Blacks and Energy, as you can imagine, in many instances, our communities are the most vulnerable on the system. And so how we think about the system and how it impinges, how it impacts those who are the end users, those who are using of the services is, is important as well. Um, and so, and I, as, also as an engineer, I'm, I, I tend to think of things in terms of design. How should the system be designed? You have to first think about what's the mission of the system. And I'll give you this uh, definition. Uh, in terms of that mission. Uh, we as energy professionals, and I come from, uh, I've been in this energy sector now for almost 40 years. And so um, we exist to most affordably produce and effectively distribute as much reliable and safe energy products and services, which are needed for basic survival and to improve the quality of life for as many people as possible for as many people as possible. That's a profound responsibility. The other thing that I would say is we have a tremendous responsibility to do this with the least adverse impact 
on human health and the environment as is possible. And that typically means the cleaner the better. So if you start with that's the mandate, that's the mission, and you also realize there's, there are still a million people on planet Earth who don't have access to affordable, reliable energy. Um, and what are we going to do about that? Um, so in, when we think about the system of the future as well, there are trends that have been mentioned already. Um, so there's going to be $131 trillion that needs to be spent on this energy system globally in order for us to reach the climate change goals. That's a lot of money. That's a lot of activity. And the thing that I would say as we think about uh, the people, the workforce, uh, the supply chain, and other things that are going to be needed in order to continue to transform this system, uh, we have to think about how do we get everyone all hands on deck, so to speak. There are many communities right now that are underrepresented in this uh, energy sector. How do we tap into that potential that is there in order for us to create the change that's needed and necessary? But then also for the end users, uh, I talk about vulnerable customers. And particularly in this age when we're going to more distributed energy resources as well. What that, what that might mean is, if we're not careful, that those who can afford the distributed energy resources also can afford to be off of the grid, or at least uh, semi off of the grid. And then those who can't afford are left uh, sh uh, shouldering the burden of maintaining the existing and older infrastructure. So we have to be careful about things relative to equity of access to these resources. How do we design a system that creates equity in this access, as we talked about, in terms of what our mission is for this entire system? Um, and so um, these are things that, you know, at the American Association of Blacks and Energy, we've been in existence for almost 50 years. Uh, we were started in 1977 during the Carter administration, during the, the energy crisis, uh, when there was uh, discussion around policies, practices, and other as it relates to the energy sector, and there were no uh, people of color in those conversations. And so how do we make sure that we have all the voices that are needed at the table in order to represent the true uh, breadth of the challenges that we face? if we're going to do this in a way that we really do have a system that allows for equity of access, that allows for the most affordable and reliable energy possible to as many people as possible. How do we go about doing that? Uh, we are certainly absolutely in the midst of this energy transition and how we think about it, how we design this system that we are building out this is the time for us to be having those conversations. Um, and so what, certainly what we want to do is provide as much insight as to what these policies, practices, what this, infra this mixture of infrastructure means to our communities, uh, and also to be able to do so in a way that helps everyone to understand the impact to the most vulnerable. Um, that's part of what our mission is as uh, an organization. So um, as the, here's what I'd also say this as we think about things like diversity, equity, and inclusion. In, in many circles, diversity, equity, and inclusion has become a four-letter word. Uh, the thing that I would say is that um, no matter what field of endeavor you're in, there is going to be diversity. Diversity very simply is. It is any mixture with similarities and differences. And any time you have a mixture with similarities and differences, there are going to be tensions and complexities. The question becomes, do we have the ability to make quality decisions in the midst of all of that tension and complexity? Do we have leaders who understand what are the outcomes that are most important for our society? And who can then sort that through so that preferences, traditions, 
customs, biases don't masquerade as requirements. It's when those things masquerade as requirements that we end up with systems that don't meet the needs. And so as we think about how do you manage diversity, whether it's a diversity of technology, it's a diversity in the workforce, it's a diversity in the supply chain. We've all seen what happens when you rely on you know, any particular supply chain and all of a sudden you run into issues with it. We saw that in spades during the pandemic. Even in our society today, about 3% of um, B2B firms provide 80% of the goods and services that are used by Fortune 500 companies. That's a tremendous amount of risk concentration in our economy. And we've seen what happens when you do that. And so how we think about diversification in all of these particular areas is important. Most financial advisors would never tell you to, in your portfolio to have 80% of your portfolio in one particular asset, asset type. So we recognize the, the need for diversity in so many other areas. And I think what part of what we, what we lose sometimes is how do you le truly leverage diversity to produce the outcomes that are most important to us? How do you leverage diversity in order to produce high performance in our society and in our economy and on our teams, in our organizations? So this skill set of managing diversity, managing similarities and differences, the tensions and the complexities, is going to be an important skill set to be in the mix as we talk about the system moving forward. So, so much of what I'm describing to you are sort of the softer side of the system, but they're very important pieces and elements of the system if we're going to create the outcomes that are most important to us. So with that, I'll turn it back. That's great, Ralph. Thank you so much. Um, Next, we'll hear from Bill Parsons. Uh, Bill is Vice President, uh, Federal and State Affairs for, the American, uh, for American Clean Power, and he's also a member of our Distinguished Advisory Board at EESI. So thanks, Bill, for joining us today. It's great to see you. Thank you. Um, good to be here. So um, ACP, the American Clean Power Association, it's a, uh, it's a unifying voice. It's a trade association. It's a unifying voice of utility scale wind, both onshore and offshore, solar, energy storage, green hydrogen, and the transmission that connects it all. So when you hear ACP or American Clean Power, uh, I, I hope that's sort of what you'll think about. Uh, this is a panel about the future of energy. So today, um, those technologies that we represent are about 15% of the electricity mix. It's not including um, uh, Malcolm's members, and so we can, we can get the clean number higher than that. Um, but we're at about 15%. If everything goes right, okay, if the IRA isn't repealed, if we don't make unforced errors in the areas of, and we don't do what we need to do, in the areas of permitting reform, trade, supply chain, to Ralph's point, workforce, there's going to be a million new jobs created in this industry over the next decade. We're going to need to find, train, and recruit talent everywhere we can get it. Big, big growth opportunity, and that's very exciting. If all of that happens, we're going to triple annual levels of renewable deployment over the next 10 years. One thing to notice in this conversation where people, I think sometimes people can erroneously shorthand intermittent, which these technologies are, solar, I mean, uh, Malcolm's correct, the, most nights uh, the sun does go down. Um, intermittent is not the same thing as unreliable. In fact, today, as we speak, there are areas of the country that are running on more than 50% renewables right now. And you're not going to hear about it because it's pretty routine and it's not a problem. So when we talk about doubling or tripling levels from here, mindful that our baseline is 15%, there's a lot of headroom here to take advantage of America's world-class resource 
very affordable electrons, 100% clean. And that's very good news. So in terms of steel in the ground today, um, up to this point, it's been about 60% wind, almost entirely onshore. 38% solar, 2% energy storage, okay? That ratio is going to flip in the next 10 years. In terms of you look at pipeline of what people are building, solar, there's gonna, we're going we're gonna to have an inflection point where solar is going to overtake wind and become the most popular uh, technology being deployed over the next 10 years. Uh, that's an interesting development. Um, new technologies, energy storage, offshore wind, green hydrogen, uh, are kind of low single digits to asterisks today. Massive opportunity for growth. That's also good news for American innovation, for the employment opportunities, for the contribution that we make to grid security. And you know, the economic competitiveness that we can have when we have, I remember, so I was a Hill guy for 15 years and I remember to Chairman Wyden's comments, there was a time when energy was you know, polluting where the thought was something like a carbon tax would send the right price signal to get people to use less of it. If your energy is clean, cheap energy is an advantage, right? And we need to move towards that. That's, that, is a, that is a national advantage that we should be moving towards. Okay, I, I wanted to say a, a couple specific words about green hydrogen, um, because that's, um, I think sometimes people talk about green hydrogen as if it is an industry that already exists. It does not. <laughs> the green hydrogen industry does not yet exist at scale. It could, and, and many of my members are, are very much hoping that it will, but we're gonna have to get a few things right. Just to kind of level set, 99% uh, of hydrogen made today uh, comes from natural gas. Uh, it is an emitting uh, uh, source of hydrogen. Uh, the way you make green hydrogen is with a machine called an electrolyzer that splits water molecules. We remember from chemistry H2O, the H is hydrogen. So an electrolyzer will split off that hydrogen molecule. Um, these these uh, electrolyzers are expensive. Um, and they need to be, uh, and so to build a business model around them, um, you have to account for that price and you have to be able to count on a utilization rate that they're not sitting idle all the time. Um, why this is relevant now, you may have heard, you know, in the RTO Insider or in other um, uh, areas of the press, there is guidance coming out around the hydrogen production tax credit. There are some decision points that are going to get made that are going to be hugely consequential as to whether this industry can launch or as to whether uh, it uh, kind of um, doesn't have an opportunity to take off. The good news is there is broad alignment around, the, if for people who delve into hydrogen, there are what are called three pillars. One is additionality. So you want to power the electrolyzer with new clean generation so that you avoid using old generation, which would have been providing you know, a clean service or clean supply of electrons to the grid. So additionality. Proximity, probably better to have the generating source that's, that's feeding the electrolyzer closer to the source, you know, closer to that electrolyzer than all the way uh, across country because the grid is different depending on which, um, you know, node and also which wholesale market you're in. Um, there is basic unanimity that we ought to insist on additionality, that we ought to be, uh, have a proximity requirement. Where the remaining um, sort of decision point is, and this is going to be consequential, is um, the question of time matching and, uh, and how quickly we can move to hourly time matching, which is, would be the strictest requirement. Um, uh, and I think it is, it is the consensus position of, of ACP members that that is a desirable uh, outcome to move towards. Um, alongside a temporary kind of on-ramp to get the industry started. Um, so a transition period where uh, annual matching would be used for several years. I think there's, there's a, a good deal of agreement in some parts of the environmental community that that's appropriate. People will debate how many years of transition period and so forth. But just I, I'm aware I'm in a room of energy policy uh, experts and staff and so forth. So this is guidance that will be coming. 
Um, the last point I want to make on hydrogen before sending this back to Dan is, you know, kind of in Malcolm's vein of why should we care? So if you go to the, uh, to the EPA website and you look at the, the, the pie chart that they have of where, um, what sectors of the economy are responsible for greenhouse gas emissions, heavy industry like cement, like steel, like long haul transportation is going to be very difficult to electrify and therefore hard to abate with just energy. Uh, and so we're going to need to have, um, but can be run on green hydrogen. That represents about 15% of emissions in the economy today. So if we want to get at that 15%, we're going to need to, to, to uh, stand up a viable, durable green hydrogen industry to get after those uh, emissions between now and mid-century. Uh, I'm happy to take any uh, questions when we get there, but Dan, thanks again for the invitation to be here. Thank you, Bill. That's great. Misty Groves is our sixth panelist, and it's very, very nice to have uh, you on the panel. Misty is the Vice President, Market and Policy Innovation for the Clean Energy Buyers Alliance. I think this is the Clean Energy Buyers Alliance first appearance at an expo, I think. Excellent, yes. Really, really Excellent. great to have you today. I am so happy. Can you see me down here? Yeah. You, you Just can. barely. Can you yeah. pass the salt? Yeah. yeah. I'm in the coveted last spot of a six-person panel at the end of the day. Thank you all for waking up and listening to my um, introduction. So thank you for hosting this event in person. Uh, we are honored that you invited the Clean Energy Buyers Association to be here today. And we were all tasked with telling you the contours of the future energy system, working toward that future energy system. So what you heard today, Mandy told you that will include the built environment, buildings and the people and pets that inhabit them. Lisa talked about the context, um, record-breaking heat with record-breaking renewable integration. Malcolm reminded us all what hydropower is and what it can be. And Ralph, I think you hit on something. You broadened the context of what the energy system is. It is not just the technology. It is about the people, processes, and policies that surround that. And then Bill, I think you did an excellent job of bringing us all the way back to the Senator's comments at the beginning that this has to be an energy inclusive, neutral, choose your word, that that is what Ira intended. So why am I here? I, my job is done. I just summed up everybody else's comments. Because what I hope you actually heard in all those details is that the future energy system is opportunity. I know we are going to talk to you about obstacles and hindrances and disagreements. And for goodness sakes, we're in a Senate building. I do not need to tell you what that means. But if we don't all agree that the future energy system, our future energy system is opportunity, we won't get there. So it is opportunity. How do I know that? Because I have been sitting on the side of US companies since around 2014, and those companies, US businesses, without being told or commanded or mandated, they have contracted for over 68 gigawatts of clean energy since 2014. These are US businesses, not energy companies. They produce things services. They're demanding clean energy at scale, and this is before the trio of legislation that has been passed investing in America. Before. And 68 gigawatts is not even the top. That only represents large-scale public investments. That does not include rooftop, non-public, utility tariffs. So that is much bigger. So that gives you a sense of why I'm sitting on the panel today. I'm rounding out the perspective of demand to make this energy future, this future energy system possible. You may not know who the Clean Energy Buyers Association is, this being our first time here, so let me tell you just a little bit. The Clean Energy Buyers Association has over 430 members. They include those large energy customers, mostly US corporations, but also institutions and industrial energy customers, as well as energy providers, and all of the other folks, service providers that make those transactions possible, NGOs and other thought leaders. Over half of our membership are energy customers. And SEBA members are responsible for 90% of that 68 gigawatts I just talked about. So we know a lot about corporate demand, institutional band, demand, and industrial demand. And it is a key component to the future energy system. And quite honestly, realizing the potential of the historic legislation. 
So let me talk a little bit about why they do it, because I said it was opportunity, and I mean it. No mandates and no commands. These are voluntary purchases of clean energy. So let me just level set. I've been in the room with dozens of CFOs and CEOs and all of the other fine people that work implementing the ideals of clean energy of CEOs and CFOs. They pursue clean energy because it makes business sense, period. They do it because it addresses material business risks and because they see legitimate business opportunities. That's why they're pursuing clean energy. So in three broad categories, operations for many US companies, energy is the second line item behind payroll. For many industrial energy customers, that is item number one, line item number one for expenses. So to decrease and stabilize operational costs, pursuing clean energy makes good business sense. The second is anticipating climate regulatory environmental risk. So US companies generally and companies across the world want to be in charge of their own mitigation strategy before they're told how to mitigate or address risk. So this is a wonderful opportunity to set the contours for a company to address all those risks on their own timetable and their own processes. And third, if you've tried to hire anyone lately, as I have, attracting talent and keeping it will absolutely be a, a particular impediment, not only of the current system, but the future <laughs> energy system. And that means to attract talent, to attract investors, you need to invest in clean energy. So I just want to leave you there as a level setting. And finally, working toward that future energy system, what do we see as trends from my perspective? I'll leave you with three. We see increased electrification. So at SIBA, we are not only interested in making sure that the current system is decarbonized, but we have an ever-growing power system. So we need to be thinking forward on buildings, like we talked about, transportation, what will be electrified and preparing for that, looking around the corner. The second is decentralization. So we will see, I think, a hastening. IRA has incentives um, to do that. It leads to resiliency and reliability. And third, digitization, which I think Lisa actually talked about, and I would even call this data access. You cannot control what you cannot measure. So US corporations are asking for more and better and enhanced information to make good carbon decisions. So I see those trends as we're working toward that energy system. Opportunity, I want to leave you with that. It does not mean we do not have work ahead of us. And two of the things that SIBA is laser focused on to unleash the opportunity that is demand of large energy customers is market access. These energy customers need access to competitively, transparently, and affordably pursue clean energy. And there are large swaths in the United States where they cannot do that. And second, transmission, which has already been mentioned here um, several times today. This year, we decided to wade into permitting principles, as many of you have. We see it as a, a alignment across the aisle and across industry. And so those two um, major barriers we see as unlocking the potential uh, for energy customers for that future energy system. Thank you again for having me. Thank you for sticking around. And thank you, co-panelists, for giving me all my talking points. Appreciate it. Thank you, Misty. Um, we're not done yet. We're going till 445, and then there's a reception. So we're... We're at the, I guess, the, we're on the other side of the hump at this point, but we still have a ways to go. And thanks for the great summary, actually, because that's a great segue for me into our first question. And we have somebody with a microphone. I think it's Sydney again. So we'll be happy to take questions from our audience. You might be asking, well, before Misty's summary, why is this panel, why, why compose a panel this big with this different, with this mix of people, with this mix of organizations? And that's because the energy system is big, it's diverse, it's complicated. All the, all the things that Ralph said, absolutely. That's why we have Ralph on the panel, it's because he can explain it very clearly. Um, the challenges of climate change are also big. They're multifaceted. They come in different shapes and sizes. They'll hit people in different places at different times. Um, and that means we all have a role to play, or your organizations all have a role to play. And so what I'd like to do is, Mandy, we can come back to you since it's been a little while since we've heard from you. I'd like to hear 
sort of where you see BTO fitting in, and Lisa and Malcolm, we'll go down to the line. Where does your organization fit in, and how do you work with others? Are there good examples of how you work sort of across the clean energy sector to ensure that what you're doing has sort of a maximum impact, your, your sort of a leveraged impact? How do you all fit together? One of the fun things about joining the organization is I'm getting to learn all these really cool efforts. And so something I didn't cover in my earlier remarks, but I want to share now is a project, a public-private partnership that we were a part of at DOE re earlier this spring. And one of the most advanced communities in, in the country, actually, is an all-electric single-family home that's connected to a microgrid and plugged into South Carolina, Southern California Edison's grid. And what we found was that the reason people were drawn to the, being a part of this project was because of resilience. They wanted to be able to watch Netflix <laughs> and not have to worry, but also that they weren't going to, um, you know, when you have health issues and you need to keep your insulin cold or you need to be able to make sure you have oxygen, you need to be able to rely on your electricity. And so this, um, this project not only is it delivering on the resilience needs, but it's also 40, using 40% 40 less energy than typical homes in that part of California. Uh, and so I share that as an example on the kinds of projects that we are supporting deployment around, not just only in the building technologies office, but also in other parts of DOE, the um, state and community energy partnership is where much of the bill and IRA money is getting um, deployed through. And so they're similar to this kind of project. They're also trying to ensure that the funding that's deployed is going to be getting on the ground around the country to things that are driving advancement to reach the goals that this panel has talked about, but doing it for, for all Americans. Lisa? Thank you, Dan. And, you know, the Business Council for Sustainable Energy, we were founded over 30 years ago to focus on readily available clean energy and energy efficiency technologies, products, and resources. That's our configuration today. And I think that's one of the things that makes us unique. We are a pure business trade association. I'm very proud to have uh, two board members here on the panel with me, Malcolm Wolf. Uh, representing the National Hydropower Association, Bill Parsons, who's a board member emeritus um, with the Business Council, with the American Clean Power Association. And I have partners here um, in Ralph's organization, and same also with Clean Energy Buyers Association. So we, are, we were founded to enact policies to deploy affordable, reliable, clean energy. And that's what we do. So I think because we represent the energy efficiency side as well as the supply side, plus as we see in the marketplace, as I was mentioning before, we are much more integrated in our deployment. It's, and there's a much more system approach, both to particular projects as well as to communities looking at their energy management. So with all that, we are very uniquely situated to be a resource to policymakers. I said the last thing that is how we, we work, we also try to close that gap between domestic policy and policies in other countries and policies at the global level. And we've been able to partner very effectively with EESI under the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change Processes. So we're working here at home to say we have the technology that's ready to go, that's affordable, reliable, and could address environmental challenges as well as economic challenges. And we also try to take that message to on a global scale. Thank you. Thanks, Lisa. Malcolm, thoughts about, you talked in your opening remarks about how hydro fits in, but could you explain a little bit more about um, sort of how you work with other, you know, other sectors? So there's the, the adage, if you want to go fast, go alone. If you want to go far, go together. Um, I think that certainly applies probably to most things in Washington, but certainly the, the energy sector. Um, you've got to work together. It all has to integrate. 
Um, the more I learn about the, the electricity system in particular, the more amazed I am that the lights ever go on when I flip the switch. Um, it's, you know, the number of near misses that, that you know, nobody talks about are, are amazing. But somehow it all works together. Um, and I think the, uh, the Academy of Engineers, I may have gotten that wrong, named the, the American electricity grid the engineering marvel of the, of the 20th century. Um, it really does contain so many amazing different parts that all work separately but have to integrate. And now we're transforming it all, digitizing it, making it more user-friendly. It all has to connect. And um, I did comment earlier that the hydropower, as kind of America's oldest first renewable resource, is sometimes taken for granted. We're just kind of built into the baseline models and, and we move on. Um, and that's a problem because uh, we can't be taken for granted. We may not be here forever, which is why we are active in the Business Council for Sustainable Energy and come to panels like this and try to work closely with all of our friends, uh, with all the technologies. Um, but it's, um, there's never enough hours in the day. Um, so let me leave it there. And Ralph, as a recovering engineer, when you step back and you look at all the different pieces fit together, or what sticks out to you? Well, I, I, I go back to the... I go back to the comments about how the system is so integrated and that understanding of how each piece, uh, how each element of the system needs to work together. How do you leverage the capabilities that are there? And how do you bring new set of capabilities to the system as well? We talk, it's been talked a little bit about um, the, from a data standpoint. But it's, in these days and times, it's more than just data. It's artificial intelligence. It's machine learning. Um, and so how do you bring those things into this mix in such a way that you're going to enhance the ability of a system to be responsive, to be reliable, um, and to lower the cost as well? And so what, I, what, I'm, what I'm struck by is just the sheer complexity that needs to be managed. Um, and to do that within an environment that, you know, um, where we see in so many instances polarization occurring relative to the tension um, that we all face. So how do we create a shared vision of what the new system, what the future system needs to look like in the midst of all of that? Do we have the ability to harmonize difference? So not only are we talking about the difference in terms of the technology, but also the difference in terms of how we envision the future and who's going to participate in that future. What does that, what does that look like? Do we have the ability, do we have the leadership capability to harmonize those differences, to create a shared vision of the future? That to me is part of what stands out. And, it, and it's a skill set that we all need, whether you're talking about the technology or whether you're talking about the people or the policies and the practices. That skill set is sort of an underlying skill set that's needed for this entire system to work. Bill, you described your ACP's membership. It's a diverse membership, but it's, there's parts of the clean energy sector that aren't part of it. So how do your members, how does ACP sort of view its position uh, in sort of the broader clean energy, and how do you leverage the work that is being done elsewhere in the sector? Well, so let me first observe that this is a, a, a period of transition and of change. And, and so just to the point of making sure it all works with itself is, uh, is clearly important. Um, listen, I've got, you know, I've got my customers to my left, right? I'm, I'm, I'm a board member here. We've got an uh, administering agency from an, an incredibly supportive and forward-looking administration and workforces here. So, um, I think what I'd like to do with my answer is maybe just give one practical example of one thing that you know we could consider as a unifying, just as an example of, an, of a unifying um, project. You, you want to work together. You got to integrate. You also want to find areas of common ground and interest. Uh, we mentioned permitting reform. Okay, um, a lot of folks in this room. You know, maybe climate motivated. Um, I, I was 15 years up here and actually I, I ran the Renewable Energy and Energy Efficiency Caucus for eight years. I think there, there was a period of time when um, what was proposed to be built was polluting and therefore it was important, many thought, to slow it down or to stop it. If we are going to tackle climate change, it is not only important that we build, but we are on the clock. It is important that we build fast. Um, 
this is a transmission we probably need 60% build from here in order to integrate. And by the way, 90 plus percent of projects waiting to interconnect to the grid are clean. So we need to have transmission. Transmission is capable, it doesn't, it doesn't know the, the, the generation source of the electrons it's carrying. Um, so this can be unifying, but I think there's, we're at an inflection point where the imperative, the climate imperative requires us to move faster than we ever have. And we need to think about that together uh, to make sure that we don't dilly-dally. I'm just reminded, one, one example, the Sun Zia line was just approved, 16 years. Now, the administration has a goal of 80% decarbonization by 2030 and, 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 and zero by 2035. Um, we probably need between 20 to 30 uh, long-haul uh, uh, lines to be built between now and then. If they all take 16 years to get permitted, we're not going to make it. That integration that all the gener generators are trying to supply won't make it. And then we won't have the jobs, we won't have the cheap electricity, and we won't have solved for climate. So I just I think about integration. I think about the ways that a diverse set of stakeholders can work together. For me, front and center right now, it's not the only example, but I would I would use permitting reform as a case study. <clears throat> and Misty, um, representing sort of the demand for all of this, how do Clean Energy Buyers Association members sort of leverage all of this to reduce emissions and create jobs? How how do you sort of see yourself and your members fitting in? Yeah, thank you. I, when we're looking to undertake um, major initiatives, the first thing we're looking at is, is it, does it meet our aspirations? So a 90% decarbonized U.S. electricity system by 2030. Crazy um, and necessary. So that's first. Does it matter to our members? And then do we have a, a unique role? And that context changes. So if you asked me whether SIBO would wade into the transmission and permitting conversation, I might say, you know, that's for Bill to do. That's just not true anymore. We see transmission now as a fundamental impediment for our members to not only do what I said was their first legitimate business interest, manage their operations, Remember, these are companies that employ folks. These are companies that produce, and they need reliable, affordable power. So that's first and second to meet their goals. So uh, I also feel like now is the moment. Um, many of us see the opportunity and the shared opportunity, and we simply I can't, we simply cannot wait the time periods that we have um, in the past to, to do that. So our energy uh, customers, our members are aligned. Uh, the other one uh, that I talked about is having access to markets. But I think if I had to choose one um, for the near term, I would, I would sign on. Thanks. So maybe we'll make this one a bit of a grab bag. Um, since we don't always want to make Misty go first or always want make Mandy go first or last and then first. Um, we, our panel opened with some remarks by Senator Wyden. He talked about the work he did in the lead up to the IRA. Um, we also had Chips and Science Act, bipartisan infrastructure law, all this great stuff. Um, but there's a lot more work to do, right? Ralph, you said, I think, $131 trillion. So the IRA was $369 billion. The bipartisan infrastructure bill was $550 billion of new spending. There's a lot of work to do. Why is it so important for Congress to still be thinking about this? And why is it especially important for Congress to be thinking about energy policy going forward on a bipartisan basis? Um, would anyone like to take a stab at that one? I will, I will call on you if I have to, but Bill, would you like to go first? Yeah, and I'll be sure because it'll just be a follow-on thought to what I just shared. So take permitting, and, and you, you, you put in a, a challenging but important qualifier on your question, which is, you know, what, on a bipartisan basis. Okay, I will tell you, with respect to permitting reform, um, we have, now, Chairman White had an interesting idea about may, maybe, you know, making a permit issuance, you know, at, at some level hinge on uh, carbon reductions. Uh, an interesting idea to see, and, and, and a cl clearly analogous with his uh, tech neutral credit. So we'll see where that goes. I, I, would, I would say, though, that 
Um, and I'm, I'm sympathetic to the point of view that you know uh, people would like to see maybe expedited permitting provided what what was what was being expedited was clean and you could have more kind of um, uh, confidence that there was low downside risk. Um, I your bipartisan qualifier kind of throws a monkey wrench in this. I don't as a practical matter. Uh, I'm not sure that I I see that in the offing near term. And so the, the, the different question I think we have to wrestle with is whether something more akin to a tech neutral, and I think this can be done responsibly without undercutting uh, you know, bedrock environmental laws, but whether a tech neutral set of permitting reforms, which is not limited just to my technologies, but tech neutral is in practice better for the shared objectives in this room than nothing at all. That's, that's the more important question we need to wrestle with because I don't think we're not really at a point where everybody's going to get everything that they want. And so the question is, what is worth pursuing uh, that is short of that ambition? Because as a practical matter, given the political math, that ambition is probably not at reach. And I, what, I, what I hear from my members and what you've heard from this group is we are, we are in the process of ener energy transition. The direction that we are headed has been set. The question is, can we move fast enough to get the emissions reductions we need and the time required? So I think um, that might be w one uh, observation I would share this afternoon. Um, go ahead. Um, Lisa made it. So we'll go to Lisa, and then we'll hear from Malcolm. I, I would just sit, take it even at a higher level. And what, you know, why should Congress continue to care? It's because of what Ralph said. It's because of people and communities. And we may focus on the environment first. We might focus on jobs. We might focus on just infrastructure modernization. You know, to have um, the kind of uh, productive lifestyle we want for all Americans, we need to modernize our infrastructure. And the energy system is a critical part of our infrastructure. So I think it really does come back at the end of the day to people and communities. And that should be a bipartisan basis for continued work in our area. Well, certainly agree on focusing on communities and, and the climate challenge and, and all those needs for, um, for urgency. Um, but let me highlight an area where I, I fiercely agree with, with Bill and ACP and an area where, uh, where I think we actually disagree, just to, uh, so we don't have just a total kumbaya party here. Um, for, you know, given the, uh, the reality that the uh, electricity system is, is rapidly changing, um, and you know, as there's new technologies, as innovation, we want that change. You know, we're not, you know, none of us came here, I don't think, on, on a horse and buggy. So we need to be embracing the new, clean, more reliable technologies. Um, that's not going to happen without permitting reform. Um, the permitting process for any technology is, is ridiculous. Um, I think, I know for, for my industry, to relicense an existing hydropower facility takes longer than to uh, relicense a nuclear facility. Um, the number of agencies that need to sign off is in the, is in the dozens. Um, and if any one of them slows down, nothing happens. Nobody can force. There's no process discipline. So there actually is bipartisan bills uh, in, in the Senate that are, that are moving this way. It's a priority for the chairwoman. I think things can still get done in this Congress. I think that HR1 was chosen, HR1 for energy permitting, because it is an issue where, perhaps for different reasons, both sides of the aisle see, see the urgency. Um, there's certainly a lot of, of red tape that's held up projects for decades, uh, and certainly the promise of the bipartisan infrastructure law and the Inflation Reduction Act can't get realized if you can't build new stuff to implement cleaner stuff. So fiercely agree on that. Um, I will take a, a friendly at odds on the, on the uh, comments on, on hydrogen. Um, very excited about hydrogen. Um, really offers an amazing promise to decarbonize sectors of the economy that are much harder to, to decarbonize, whether it's the industrial sector or helping with you know, uh, other forms of transportation. So the promise of, of the hydrogen, green hydrogen, is, is great. Um, but I'm not sure that there's uh, you know, near unanimity on additionality, um, at least from my association's perspective. Um, if you acquire additionality, you're never going to stand up at the hydrogen industry. Uh, if you have to first build the, uh, the power plants, build the transmission, then build the hydrogen facilities, we're missing, we're missing a critical window. 
Um, we believe that all forms of clean energy should be eligible as green. So if you're zero carbon, you should count. Uh, we think that's what Congress intended when they passed the, the provision last year. So we don't think there should be discrimination uh, against existing zero carbon resources. I don't think that hydropower or nuclear power should be excluded if you can use those technologies to build hydrogen facilities now. Hey, if they're zero carbon, that's great. Let's use them. Um, and I think kind of one comparison is electric vehicles. You know, we want electric vehicles to be put on the grid. We don't require additionality before we sell an, uh, an electric vehicle. You know, we know that 80% of electricity sold is under long-term contracts. Those aren't going to change. We also know, as Bill said, that 80% of new generation uh, is, is clean technologies. So I don't think we need to delay the hydrogen industry by imposing additional requirements of additionality. Um, we're going to get we're going to get there anyway. So friendly area where we can disagree. Mandy, I want to take it to the very practical. So I gave you an example of an announcement that Secretary Granholm gave last week, in which we are announced many awards to work on building energy kits. There's a lot of exciting announcements like that going out. I'm curious by show of hands when we put an application out and call for people to say, I would like to do cool things with your money. Uh, what do you, do you think we get tens more applications that we can fund? Hundreds? Thousands? So it's definitely in the higher category. And these are all extremely deserving applicants. I ask you to think about the schools that your kids or grandkids or nieces or nephews might go to and the quality they're in, or the recreation center where you may swim. We have a lot of aging infrastructure in this country, and not only do we need to get it up to the standard to be able to exist in high heat days like we're experiencing here, uh, but also to be able for these facilities to embrace the leading edge technology. And so, candidly, we need the continued support of Congress so that we can continue to march through this long list of well-deserving community projects that we're seeing at DOE right now, but only have a limited amount of funding that we can support. Misty, I don't want to move off the question if you would like anything. I, I'm afraid that perhaps I missed a signal. Would you like to weigh in? I just want to say, at this point, no one should abdicate their duties. Every single body um, and Congress, as far as I know, is when it working an incredibly powerful and profound body for producing legislation that can help private investment, that can help its constituents the built environment. And so we should all be looking for what we can do now and together. And um, we are here to help in that conversation. I'm scanning for questions. Happy to take questions. I just, I oh, to, well, go ahead, Ralph, please. Yeah, I just wanted to share a, a couple of reasons why I think it's so important and that to the extent that we can, even in this environment, that it be bi bipartisan. Number one, problems today cannot be solved with the same level of thinking that created the problems we're dealing with. The problems we are dealing with, by, in large measure, are unintended consequences of the solutions we deployed yesterday. And so we have to work and think together about how to solve them. That's number one. Number two, if we look at the distributional outcomes, in many instances, the, Part of the reason why there's not a lot of trust in the system is because people look at the distributional outcomes and think there's something wrong with that. There are two things that are needed in order for there to be trust in the system, distributional justice and procedural justice. And somehow we've got to come together and create that. We've got to have a system that creates procedural justice and distributional justice. And if we don't do that, we're going to continue to see the kind of polarization that we see today. Thank you. Um, so I have a question that I'd like to ask to build off that. So we've, you know, toward the energy system of the future, be clean, yes, but we also want it to be better, right? And to your point, 
Um, we need it to be equitable. We need it to be affordable, accessible to everybody. Um, Mandy, maybe we'll start with you as the, I know DOE is putting a huge amount of priority on sort of the equitable distribution of these incentives and things like that. But um, sort of as we move towards sort of in that journey, what are some steps that we should be taking or that your organizations or member organizations are taking to help ensure that when we reach the energy future system of the future, that it's a better, more equitable energy system? Um, I'm happy to start with you and we can go down through the line unless anyone would just like to hop in. Well, as you're all very familiar with, there is the Justice 40 requirements with both the bill IRA and IRA funding. And like we started this with, I've been at DOE now, this is my fifth week. So I've spent my career working more in the nonprofit policy sector. And it's been really fascinating to watch how that named prioritization on these issues has enabled people at DOE to really lean into this and think about it holistically think and think about it with great curiosity. And so it's been fun and just lovely to now be uh, on the inside of DOE and to see the authentic commitment people have to figuring out how to embed uh, equity and justice into the work at, at the different levels that Ralph has just talked about to, to really think about it holistically. And there's also awareness that it's going to take time to evolve uh, and to, one, identify where we've not been um, getting it right, you know, the, the unintended consequences that Ralph just uh, mentioned, but then also to think about how we involve a broader set of voices in influencing and advising us on how we design programs so that hopefully we can not repeat those same mistakes. Um, and what I will just report to you is that the excitement, joy, and commitment that I'm experiencing from my colleagues it just has been one of the absolute highlights of my early, this early time at DOE. And that gives me hope for the way that we will be able to effectively address this going forward. Lisa, if you'd like to continue, we can go down through the line. Sure, I'll be very brief here too, but I think it's uh, back to, again, this concept of you know digital solutions and information. So one just one of the ways, building on some of the things that I've heard before, is how do we get information so people can make choices and resources to all communities? And when I think about, you know, my first orientation to the energy sector, you know, there was a whole socialization. Well, you shouldn't really be thinking what's behind the switch. It should be there on demand and it should be very low cost and we, you shouldn't have to think about anything else. Well, the world we're in today, we, we don't have the luxury on any topic really to just be that dismissive. We do have to understand what's behind the wall. Um, we have to make sure that we're making the right choices about our own personal energy management. But what many communities still don't have is access to information. So even though, um, you know, the, for, dig for digital solutions to work, you need to have broadband. And so when I think about the bills that were enacted in the last couple of years, to me, I think that is really a game changer. If we can get broadband to communities that have not had it, um, we will unlock a whole lot of potential decision-making and knowledge exchange. And hopefully that'll be coupled with all of these resources that will be continuing to funnel through from the Inflation Reduction Act, from the Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act, and you know, individual households as well as cities and localities will be able to take advantage of both that information and then those resources. Malcolm, how, how what is... NHA doing to ensure that the energy system of the future is equitable, just, and inclusive? Um, it, it's, a, it's, a, it's a really critical, important question. I think the, we all want the energy system, the electricity system, to look like the customers we serve. And we're a far cry from that. Um, the hydropower industry is basically 70% white man. Um, the even worse news is that that's better than the energy system overall. Um, not much, but slightly. So it dwarfs, you know, it's, it's out of proportion. Um, and, but, you know, when you've got all those old white men, you know, today things are better. Women are the majority of college students. Things have changed. You know, we're going to get there with time. No. 
the number, my hydropower industry is heavily engineering focused. Um, and women engineers are still, well, I, I'm, I was trying to quickly look up the statistic. I, I'm, I'm pretty sure it's less than one third of graduates. Um, and people of color, it's even less. So the problem is really systemic. Um, and we're really struggling with what to do. It's an easy excuse to say, oh, well, that's what the college is. You know, we can only hire what the colleges produce, so it's not our problem. That, that's, that doesn't cut it. Um, but we're really struggling um, working uh, with veterans groups and, and others to try to expand it. We've got a long way to go. Yeah, so um, the things that we're doing at Abe to try to um, help in um, creating a more inclusion, greater diversity, and that sort of thing is uh, to the point earlier that was just raised, you know, uh, in our community, you have to create this awareness of where the opportunities are. Um, and then you have to, we have to put people in front of them that look like them. Um, and that's part of what we do as the American Association of Blacks and Energy is to go back in our community so that our kids see that they can be successful in this industry because what they see is what they'll be. Um, and so that's, that, that at least starts that process of awakening, if you will, of, to what the opportunities are. Now it's about the support system um, it's about providing um, scholarships, internships. Um, it's about providing the, the ability to, to enter into the workforce in any number of pathways. Uh, how do we support those things? Because as I mentioned at the very start, all hands on deck. We can't afford to have community with talent that is latent, that is not being tapped into and brought to the table to help us to solve these issues. And so we are, we are really focused on how do we partner with others? How do we create programs? How do we create um, um, awareness? How do we do those things in a way that we can make an impact? Uh, and honestly, our, our appetite to make that impact is bigger than our resources right now. Um, and so for those of you that are within the sound of my voice, we want to partner with you to help make an impact. So. And remember, we have a live cast going, so you just told that to an awful lot of people. Yeah. So. <laughs> Bill? A couple quick observations. I, I feel like this is uh, one of these kind of uh, let, let a, a thousand flowers bloom. I, there, there's a lot of work to be done here, and there are, several, there are multiple levels at which to do it. Um, I know just for my member companies, there's, there's not one of them that isn't um, making this priority, not, you know, not even for sort of uh, 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 baldly noble reasons, because it's smart business. So uh, do you, we, we, just, we just had a, our, our trade conference in clean power, no fewer than eight sessions uh, on or adjacent to this topic, thing one. Thing two, this is a little bit heretical in the, in this, in the Hart Senate office building, but not every issue necessarily uh, is going to be exclusively solved by the government or by federal policy. I'll give you an example. When I was at ACOR, um, and this is you know, an example of kind of like the thousand flowers blooming, we decided we would create a program called Accelerate, and we invited minority and women entrepreneurs to participate, and they got a free membership in ACOR and got to network. And what we, when we talked to them about what they were looking for, usually it was like they wanted a shot. Like they wanted an introduction to somebody who could give them a, a subcontract on a job, or they wanted us to introduce them to one of our uh, finance member companies to see if they couldn't get a loan or, or qualify for a tax equity investment. And so, believe it or not, we thought about it. And we were like, all right, we'll do it. Like we'll do speed dating. We literally got them together for two hours, and out of, out of that two hour investment, four of the Accelerate members got contracts and or investments. And, you know, is this. You know, is that like the be all and end all at scale? No. Is it a game changer for those who benefited? It is. So let's not be the only flower blooming, but that, you know, stuff like this can happen. Now, as it relates to federal policy, the good news is um, the IRA actually anticipated a lot of these questions and decided to try to align incentives in a way that's inclusive. And inclusivity, there's a lot of dimensions to inclusivity, right? So let's, let, let's, let's take off a few. The way the tax credits are structured, there's a bifurcated structure, so you don't get full value tax credits unless you're paying prevailing wage and you have an apprenticeship program. Okay, those apprenticeship programs are gonna be important ladders of opportunity for people looking for uh, high paying, high growth careers in the sector. 
Uh, number two, the energy community's tax credit. This is incentivizing developers to build in areas that either were historically uh, dependent on uh, fossil generation or extraction uh, that are going away, uh, or areas with higher unemployment. Okay. Two final credits that kind of work together if we get them right. One is the domestic content credit, the other is the advanced manufacturing production tax credit. Um, over time, for uh, knowable reasons, we allowed our industrial base in this country to become offshored. I think there's a bipartisan consensus that that pendulum has swung too far. Uh, and for a whole host of reasons, we would be better off if we reshored more of the clean energy supply chain. Zero daylight with the, uh, the clean power industry on this point. What I will say is, and this is good news, um, I, I don't know if people are aware, there is a manufacturing renaissance happening in the United States right now in the clean energy sector. Over the preceding seven years, there were 18 manufacturing starts announced in the clean energy space. 18. In the past 11 months, 74. It's a fourfold increase in less than a year. And we, we're updating these, for anybody who wants a, a great resource, congressional staff or otherwise, if you go to the cleanpower.org website and just do the forward slash investing in America. We, we're, we're updating this weekly. We used to do it monthly. We were doing it quarterly, then monthly, now weekly because the, 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 the data is changing that quickly. So really an exciting story there and, and, and contributing to the kind of uh, uh, inclusive growth we want to see in the clean energy economy. Misty, I think this gives you the last word on the panel. Now, you may answer my question. You may say anything else you want. I have no recourse. You're the last panelist getting to answer the question. So give you the last word today. Wow, careful. I'll answer your question because I think it's fundamentally important to this transition. Um, and I'll just hit one aspect. At SEBA, one of the things we say our transformational pathway to this future energy system is that we intend to use customer-driven clean energy to decarbonize the grid for those who can't or won't. Um, and as many of you know, uh, greenhouse gas emissions also come hand in hand with other negative externalities in communities. And so we want to make sure that we are driving demand and policy advocacy for our members to local communities for all hours of every day uh, in the dirtiest grids in the dirtiest times, uh, that not only that local investment can lead to increased jobs, but better health outcomes in those, um, in those communities as well. And so that's all the way up to our strategic plan and embedded into everything that we do um, is thinking on making sure that we're driving that demand and policy to help communities. So thank you. Thank you very much. Um, Mandy, Lisa, Malcolm, Ralph, and Bill, and Misty, thank you so much for being very good panelists on a very big panel. Six, when we do the survey, six might be a little much, but you guys were great, tremendously good sports, and really, really interesting points. I think they definitely deserve a round of applause. Thank you so much. <laughs>